Converse, an anthology of the best contemporary Indian poetry in English, and compiled by Sudeep Sen, uh, was a specially commissioned project to honor the 75th anniversary of India's independence from the British rule. Since we just completed our grand celebrations on August 15th, this poetry session promises to be a very meaningful one with poetry from Ashwani Kumar, Maitreyi Chaudhary, Naveen Kishore, Sudeep Sen, and Vinita Agrawal. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely, lovely to be back here again. After six years, I was here at the inaugural uh, edition of this festival, and I must say that this, I call them the crack team between Maitrey and Lakshmi and Shubhod and the rest of them. I mean, the love for poetry they have and the kinds of crowds they get for poetry is just quite something. So today we'll be launching this book. This just arrived two days ago. And so Bangalore get, has the privilege of seeing the first copies. I'm going to do something crazy and unusual. Uh, one of my oldest best friends lives in Bangalore. so. He's a very keen reader of poetry, though he's a radiologist by profession. So I've just asked him to come. And Arjun Kalyanpur, would you mind launching the book? I'd like to congratulate and compliment the publishers of this book as well as the uh, poets who are published herein. I think it's a very valuable tradition and service that you're carrying on. And uh, although I come from the dark side of the science world, I would say that uh, you have many fans on the side as well. Um, I'd also like to pay tribute to my old friend Sudeep, whom I've known for 51 years, believe it or not. We met in first standard in St. Columba School in the year 1971. So I would say the term Chaddi Buddies was coined for us. Um, Sudeep has been an inspiration in many ways. He's at a time when everyone was doing either medicine or engineering, he steadfastly held, held on to his dream and did higher English and wrote his first poem, I think, when he was about 14 or uh, thereabouts. The lunar visitation. So uh, here's to you, Sudeep, for keeping the dream going and inspiring all of us. And once again, congratulations to all of you for this fabulous publication. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I just felt that you know, a, a, a familiar note needs to be struck um, because often poetry is uh, put in a context of over formality. And uh, when that happens, you lose that intimate distance between the word and the emotion. Uh, fortunately, the poets I'm sharing the stage with are just such fine poets, but they also happen to be lovelier souls. Uh, and, you'll, and that comes across through their writing. So what we are going to do is I'm going to just read part of the introduction so that you know what, what the book is all about. And, how it's been constructed and why it's been constructed in that particular way. Then we will read not only two poems of our own from the book, but also another poet who features in the book who may not be here. It's part of saying, we remember you, we are all in it together, and wherever we travel, we are traveling as a family. And that sense of familiarity is important, which is partly why my 51-year-old friend was up on stage other than some silly minister. <laughs> so I'll just read part of the introduction, one and a half pages of the introduction, so that you have an idea of the, the basis for the book. It's called Converse, and so it's conversation, 
uh, communicating between people who versify and so on. So you can pun left, right, and center in any way you would like to. Converse Contemporary English Poetry by Indians celebrates 75 years of India's independence through the writings of its living poets. So all the poets who are in this book are all alive. <coughs> and for such a celebration, it is a privilege to open the anthology with a towering figure of Jayanto Mohapatro. Born in 1928, he is the first Indian poet in the English language to have won the Sahitya Academy Award for Poetry and to have published new poems in the New Yorker on several occasions. My personal acquaintance with Mahapatra goes back to the 1980s, Tata. The fiction section at that time used to be edited by Kushwan Singh. The Telegraph under him was the first publication to carry my early poems. I was perhaps in the first year of my honors degree in, in English, uh, literature at the time, over the years, he became my mentor, a friend, a guide, someone who I've spent many days conversing with, sitting on the slanted branch of the mango tree in his garden in Tinkonia Bagicha in Khatak. Remarkably, at this age, even at the age of 95, he continues to edit and publish his long-standing literary print journal, Chandrabhad, one of the best of, it, of its kind, in India's literary history. Mahapatra has the advantage of some 20 years over the youngest poet in this anthology, Supriya Kaur Dhaliwal, born in 1995. I met her at a writer's residency in Te Aroha in Uttarakhand's Dhana Chubi some years ago. She had then published a fledgling limited edition, uh, a collection of verse, on the way back from the residency on a several hour train journey, she showed a bright eyed curiosity to learn about the poetic process and at an opportune moment occupied the seat next to me to workshop many of her poems. Now can you imagine being trapped or being blessed with someone who wants to critique your work for three hours? But just the energy I thought was wonderful. Since then, she has gone on to publish her first proper collection in London from a very good publisher, and it's called Yak Dilemma. I relate these two experiences with these two poets separated by over 40 decades in time as an illustration of the long-standing living tradition of India, that of collegial and intellectual mentorship among older and younger poets, what in the performative arts of Indian classical music and dance is called the Guru Shishya Parampara. In very degrees, the literary mentorship tradition has been an immense personal benefit to me from the senior Indian poets like Jan Mahapatra himself, Mr. Mazikal and Don Morais, from Nobel laureates such as Derek Walcott, Joseph Brodsky and Seamus Heaney, what I refer to here is a sense of continuum, a literary legacy, an artist's benevolence, a sense of passing down the baton from generation to generation that makes for an ongoing living tradition. For this anthology, I decided to concentrate on living English language poets from India and the Indian diaspora. By the way, when I was putting this book together, we got 15,000 pages of poetry to wade through, so that's the kind of volume one had to read through. That meant leaving out several important poets who are no, who are no more, uh, Ezekiel, Ramanujan, Kolatkar, Morais, Shivke Kumar, Agashahid Ali, Mina Alexander, Vijay Nambisan, to only, main, only name a few, but I hope to record their presence and legacy by way of the epigraphs you will find in the introduction. And then, of course, we talk about various things. So that's the basis for it. Because I think, again, when I was talking about familiarity, collegiality, that intense uh, drawing room atmosphere where you dissent, where you cross-cut each other intellectually, even if you don't agree with each other, you're there learning from each other. A lot of that has diminished, unfortunately, sadly. But it's something that I think we should hold on to. So as a homage, let me read one poem of Jayanta Mahapatra to kick off the evening of readings. 
And this one is called Dawn at Puri. Endless crow noises, a skull in the holy sands tilts its empty country towards hunger. White-clad widowed women pass the centers of their lives awaiting to enter the great temple. Their austere eyes stare like those caught in a net hanging by the dawn's shining strands of fate. The frail early light catches ruined leprous shells leaning against one another, a mass of crouched faces without names, and suddenly breaks out of my hide into the smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre and fills my aging mother. Her last wish to be cremated here, twisting uncertainly like light on the shifting sands. That's Jayanta Mahapatra, born in 19, 1928, still living, extremely frail. Subodh was telling me, with the insistence of Maitre, he visited your festival last year and came here and read. Uh, an incredible man, really. So he's the senior most poet in the book. I'll read a couple of poems, and then we'll have the galaxy of the proper poets who will come and read after me. The first poem I'll read is called Language, and um, it's partly to do with what we've done with language, misuse of language, cancel culture, fake culture, fake news, the way Elections are twisted through spinning of language and so on. We've somehow forgotten what language means, the basic integrity and humanness of language. Part of it is about that, is just a comment. And I got trolled for this, of course. The other part of it is essentially a little boy's homage to his first typewriter. I still have my first typewriter, which I bought ages ago. Um, it works, but it's more expensive to source the red and, white, red and black silk ribbons now than to actually get the typewriter going. It's called Language, and it opens with an epigraph from Italo Calvino, and I quote, without translation, I would be limited to the borders of my own country. The translator is my most important ally. My typewriter is multilingual, its keys mysteriously calibrating my bipolar forked tongue. Black red silk ribbons spools unwind as the carriage moves right to left. In cursive hand, I write from left to right. My tongue was born promiscuous, speaking in many languages. My heart spoke another, my head yet another. The translation, seamless. Oracles, ventricles, pump blood. Capacel-like alphabets, phrases, syntax, cross-fertilize my text, breathing life. Texture enriched, music, Cadence, spatially enhanced, osmotic, polyglottal, a polygamy of grammar. Letter forms, dance, ligatures, pirouette, ascenders, descenders, pitch perfect. Imagination isn't caged in speech. Speech cannot be caged in language. And uh, the second poem I'll read, and I'll, I'll finish there before uh, my colleagues take over. This is called Om, colon, a sediment. Uh, there are italicized lines in the poems, which are basically Aga Shahid Ali's lines, the great Indian Kashmiri poet. People who know his poetry will 
no, so I'm not going to alert you which lines they are. And uh, this was written at a time when that terrible master plan was uh, shoved down our throats where the Lutchens Delhi, the India Gate was going to become a Disneyland. And you know, thousands and thousands of trees were being cut. Uh, it's a mess up there in Delhi, you know. Anyway, so it's a poem of grief, it's a poem of hope, but let's see, it's a poem of solidarity, really. Uh, it, uh, Om, a ceremony, and it opens with a short phrase from Gethe, and I quote, architecture of frozen music. In my city, I'm surrounded by constant cries of the dying, burning fires heaving under burden of wood, smoke, and bones, wailing summed up by the sonic notes of Om. Civilization's first sound, Sanskrit syllable echoing a conch shell's harmonic mapping, its involute spiral geometry holding within and emanating airborne sonar screams. My ancestors, grandmothers, mother, blew into the smooth shell, cupped in their palms, held intimately as if it was a talisman, a prayer, a pranayam in yoga's daily ritual. But breathing is such a privilege these days, Pandemic struck, oxygen deprived, my friends perish, the country buckles airless. Even an exquisite ceremony lacks the sheen to wax or wrap the contours of a corpse now. Each day as I write endless condolence notes, etching dirge-like couplets on gravestones, my city continues to be dug up not to make space for burial sites, but for palaces of illusion. An architecture of frozen music, greed, calumny. A country without a government, a country without a post office, Shahid laments. Let me cry out in that void, say it as I can. I write in that void. Om celebration now, a seizing requiem, yet we chant in hope for peace. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Hello, thank you for being here to tonight. Um, this is a very special anthology, um, like Sudeep has already mentioned. Um, I'll be brief. I'll first read a poem from Mamang Dai. I was born in the Northeast myself, and I think it's only appropriate that I read a poem from a fellow poet who's based out of the Northeast. Mamang Dai is a government, government servant who she is based out of Arunachal Pradesh, very senior poet, one of the finest from the Northeast. So here is Mamang Dai talking about the river. Do not stay too long by the river. The river is a wayward god. It is an elephant, a lion. Sometimes they call it horse. One summer we thought it was a peacock. Turning in the yellow dust that filled our eyes with gold, I saw a woman floating in a lily pond, in a mountain of mist, wrapped in a cloud, streaming with tendrils and pollen dust. I thought the river is a woman, a country, a name. A note of music trapped in the white current, a sheet of paper carrying a secret map. The skyline is where it begins, between the darkness and the summit, in the birthplace of thirst. Do not stay too long by the river. It is a drowning spirit, a strong armed God, drawing and withdrawing such seasons, flowing river standing still, 
river, sea, river, ocean, river of all our summers, collecting the salt of our lives. Thank you. For those of you who haven't stayed by a river, uh, this poet might have more meaning. For me, who has stayed by three rivers, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, and now the Kaveri, this is very special indeed. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I'm going to read um, two of my poems. These are very short poems. Thank you, Sudeep, for having me. Um, my daughter has very beautiful long hair. And whenever I comb her hair, there is something about it that always touches me. And my aunt also had very beautiful long hair. And through the generations, I've seen how hair touches each generation. This poem is for all of them. I call it My Aunt's Hair. Winter afternoons lie horizontal and pickled in long hair. While I look through the photographs of my mother, aunt, and their mother, my grandmother, before she lost her country, her mind, and then set fire to her hair. In each of these pictures, they sit singing to someone I cannot see. Their hair, their long winter hair, an eclipse now from where I memorize their songs of my history sung out to me. Moth-eaten, charcoal black pages of photographs with gilded golden corners now bear witness to this story of song and hair. Grow leaves and sprout flowers like the Kalpa Vriksha. The winter after, the doctors put my grandmother in an asylum, cut her hair, tied her hands, and put her in a wheelchair. My aunt since then stopped tying her hair, an old rebellion now futile. But on days when the orange is just ripe and the sun a crimson ball, my daughter and I, we sit in the same yard where grandmother's songs still live. Her hair fans out, covers the river, washes sorrow. We become two states, two languages, and thunder down both. To be able to comb another's hair is love. To be able to breathe that crisp love is home. Hair becomes the language of memory then. Swish, swish, swish. Familiar whispers between women, secrets only they know how to sing. I pass on my comb to my daughter from the shores of the seaside now forgotten. Tomorrow when she sits at the foot of my trembling bed and watches my hair like childhood rain, she will learn her history through kept hair. Turn singer in another winter afternoon horizontal. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The next poem is a very short poem, I promise. It's called The Death of Vulture. The poem is, um, seeks to bring out the violence that is often uh, not talked about, which uh, we sometimes see in children. I saw it personally many a times and wrote this poem. The Death of a Vulture. Birds of prey take time to die. Take, for instance, a feather from this dead vulture, the one I carried back home one afternoon when six. We had found it half dead on the streets, my friend and I. And while we poked, defeathered, turned it around, and did things unimaginable that only children that only kind children of a certain age can. It lay there, certain only of death. 
I understood then that birds die, but feathers remain and germinate in books that flower across bookshelves in time. Thank you. Thank you, Bangalore, for having me here. And thank you, Atagalata. And I was asking, uh, you know, uh, Atagalata uh, Subodh that, you know, what is the meaning of Atagalata? So, Galata means fun, happiness. So, I'm from Mumbai and uh, hope I share joy and fun. Uh, first, let me just uh, speak a little bit, just, just very short, I will be not in my professorial tone and mood, you know, not at all. Uh, Sudeep, congratulations for you know, this monumental work. Uh, and um, while going through this work, I became so emotional uh, that I wanted to quote Aga Shahid Ali, I want to really sob in your arms and call me smile tonight, seriously. Uh, this is, uh, please, uh, you know, what you have done, you know. It's a, it's a very unique anthology and clearly establishing, proving uh, Dilip Chitre, you know, I mean like uh, critique and uh, a famous per, uh, bilingual poet, who considered once uh, that English, Indian English poets are basically uh, inhabiting uh, a landless, sort of a landless minority. But this anthology, I call it a transversal anthology in a Deridian sense, uh, is a transversal anthology traversing across known genres, un unknown genres, known geographies, unknown geographies is clearly proving that Indian English poets are no longer landless minority. So thank you very much. Uh, I will be very short, brief, uh, to all of you, and normally I write very long poems, uh, but Sudeep uh, thinks that, uh, Ashwini, uh, you have very strong poem poems in anthology. Thank you, Sudeep. Sudeep uh, very good old friend, Sudeep, and uh, we have never ever fought with each other, never, never, ever, never ever quarreled with each other, never. So this book is also inspired by, inspired by, uh, I call a book, this ethics of Maitri. Thank you very much for, you know, inculcating this spirit of Maitri. So this poem I'm gonna read first, uh, Ranjit Hoskote, and very close friend, uh, you know, both Ranjit and Nancy, I mean, like, dedicated to them. And this poem is titled, from the collection I'm reading, Ranjit's poem uh, is called, All Gods Travel. So let me see. All Gods Travel, Some Ride Camels. All gods travel, some ride camels, other rides, other rides catastrophes. Others ride catastrophe. Some shimmer along a peeling bell, others chase tow trucks, taking turns to ball their fist or stick their tongues out. Some hide, some hide in your sleeves or turn into spiders at night. It was spiders at night, and some remember they were packed into camphor, scented chest, carried across rivers, breathing bloated days and shivering nights, until they passed down on the car to call halt. All gods travel, all gods travel, but when we want them to stay, some turn their backs on us, pat on Asian dog on the head, and look out to see. Thank you very much. And only two poems, very short poem, uh, a short poem, and then a very, very short poem that I have never, ever written. Thank you, Sudeep. And if you consider this is my strongest poem over a career of 20, 30 years of writing, thank you very much. Uh, I've never, ever written that kind of a poem, but that has a, you know, a fire and a raise that poem. I will come back uh, as a concluding poem. But let me begin with uh, Satyagraha, coinciding with 75th uh, year of freedom and Tiranga, Mera Tiranga, Tera Tiranga, whatever it is. So uh, I'm not in official situation now, so I can do some, some rage here and there and commit some blasphemy. So it is about our colony, and our colony as a Mumbaiker, we were fighting a major battle. It's a people's movement, and the poem is titled Satyagra. It's about Gandhi. In the smoky wooden corner of your eyelid, in the smoky wooden corner of your eyelid, I agitate, I agitate like a wounded blue whale. And the sea erases the wrinkles of the past atrocities. Gathering, gathering slowly in your imperial brows, I speak the voices of under trial prisoners and ride the toy cycle, the toy cycle like an aging boy in Sabarmati. In the untimely violence of seasons, 
I drown in the sorrows of charred wheat fields and feed the hungry with mountain of breads. There are only truths and beauties in the soft, insurgent prayer songs of green lions protesting against the felled trees of our economy. Young ants, young ants are accused of smashing window panes of tyrants' houses, and the sky is filled with tattered shoes of martyrs. The old harmonium, the old harmonium hung on my neck and the pamphlets of salt satyagraha in my pocket, I enter the town of peace and peasants, sing it with tattooed camels in chorus, Ishwar Allah Tero Naam, Sabko Sanmati De Bhagwan. Ishwar Allah Tero Naam, Sabko Sanmati De Bhagwan. May Allah bless you all in your name. Thank you. And the last, it's about a matchbox. Thank you. Don't burn it. Bangalore, stay safe. Matchbox is a tribute to Arun Kolapkar and Dilip Chitre. Find a burial place for yourself. Matchbox. Find a burial place for yourself, said my village priest. No thanks, I told him. Give me your matchbox. I will burn all your gods. I will burn all your gods. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be reading in, uh, in front of a full house. Thank you, Bangalore. So the other poet I'm going to read from this anthology, and congratulations, Sudeep, on this marvelous compilation, is uh, Sukrita Paul Kumar's poem. She was invited to the festival but couldn't make it because there were some important guests who were you know, staying at her place, so she couldn't come. So I thought, at least let me read her poem. It's one of my favorite poems from among her works. This one's titled Vaga. At Vaga, I love you the most, the border marked by the spectacle, spectacle of stomping army boots, shining medals, beating their chests into the rising and setting sun, the day becoming night and the night day, when the guards on both sides exchange bang bang. I love you the most at Vaga, when the guns are raised to salute separation, division and rupture, when the neighbor dies and wears the shroud becomes enemy all at once. My friend, you go away only as a bird does, flying in the free skies. When lines of hatred rise against prayer flags, Vaga happens. And I love you the most because you are on the other side of the border. Wow, it's beautiful. So I think we're running out of time, so I'll just read one of my poems from the book. This one's titled, When the, when the Zafar Mahal Was Being Built in 1842. So this I conceived of as trees being witness to history. You know, a lot of things happen over the years, but some of these trees that outlive us, who live for 300, 400 years, they must have witnessed history passing, uh, the historical events happening in the world. So this is from that perspective. This devdar would have been a sapling growing quietly towards corrosive times. The Himalayan fir would be soundlessly groping for the memory of stones. The Burma teak losing a battle in lending resolute patience to Buddhist monks. The mangroves of tidy plains cowering thinner against steel and concrete, the Kashmiri walnut acquiring ring by ring the dark luster of the state's frustration, each tree a tower of silence, a mausoleum of words that should have been spoken. Thank you very much. I thought I'd break the rhythm a little bit and read my poems first. <laughs> this one's called Silence. On both sides of the screen, a forced silence. The 
This one's called gather. Go gather the flowers for the wreaths. Go. From door to door gathering. Sheets for shrouds. There is no time to grieve. And one last one for Salim Miradina. It's called Stapler. I was your first, but you have held on to me for good. I was borrowed from the office and never returned. No one missed me and I was free from their rough handling. This is home now. This corner of the desk where you can reach me with the stretch of your arm. I'm a baby croc with open mouth, a nudge on my nose, and my jaws snap shut. I stitch corners and paper ends. I hold words in place. Keep your narrative from breaking down. We have stuck it out for 40 busy years. Although I'm a, getting a bit rusty on the edges, but so are you. Yeah, so there's this uh, wonderful person here who's putting these placards saying, go home. <laughs> but she's doing her job, she's doing her job. So we'll cut the discussion out on the Q&A for the sake of other colleagues who will be following us. But just to say that all my friends and colleagues' books are outside, do go and buy them. If you like their poetry as much as I do, the only way you can show love is to buy three copies each of each of their titles. <laughs> And uh, we are all there. We are all there to sign our books. Uh, poetry is a joyous occasion. It binds us all together. And let's just celebrate uh, goodness, calm, and happiness. Thank you. <laughs>